Hi, everybody. Come on. Hi. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about kind of how things happen gradually and then suddenly. Um, how many of you feel, there's a couple of audience participation moments in this, so I'm going to need you to participate. Um, uh, how many of you feel like life has gotten faster? Just a show of hands, kind of raise your hands if you feel like life has gotten faster. Okay, good number of you. So we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, I'm going to save you kind of the commercial. I, you know, I, one of the co-founders of CB Insights. Um, I, I'm going to brag a little bit about CB Insights just very quickly. Uh, you know, we're an Inc. 5000 company. Last week we were named the ninth best place to work in the USA by Glassdoor. So um, an amazing team. Um, and so kind of props to them, uh, I want to make that very clear. So we're going to talk about four things today, kind of, you know, life as individuals has gotten faster, but I think what we're also seeing is that markets are moving faster than ever before, and kind of what we see, and we work with lots of corporations, is that they actually are sort of having trouble responding to this, and sort of, you know, why is that, what are the impacts of that, and then, you know, how can, how can they sort of see around corners quicker? So that's going to be kind of the, the broad strokes of what we're going to talk about today. So first, let's talk about markets moving faster. Um, this is a great, uh, this is Ernest Hemingway uh, in The Sun Also Rises asked his questions, how did you go bankrupt, right? And the answer was two ways, gradually and then suddenly, right? And so this is sort of a phenomenon that we're seeing a lot these days is kind of gradual decline followed by sudden decline. We want to kind of talk through that. Um, you know, we think sort of corporations are not immune to this same acceleration, right? And so how does that look, right? And so some of you have seen these slides from us before, right, which is kind of the lifespan of an S&P 500 company, how it's declined over time, right? So just staying on top has become harder than it ever has been. Um, this is a great uh, visualization by the folks at Visual Capitalist that looks at market cap of the biggest, tech com uh, the biggest companies over time, and you see in 2006, one of the five was a tech company in 2011. One of the five was a tech company in 2016. Tech ran the board, and that lead has only grown. My favorite graphic of all time, which I have to throw into every presentation I do, is uh, technology adoption over time. So I, I don't have a pointer, but if you can just look here, telephone in 1900, let's say about 5% penetration, got to a 90% penetration over 105 years. And then if you look over on the right of that x-axis, you see cell phone and internet kind of got there in 15 years, right? So technology adoption is happening quicker than ever before, and it's getting even faster, right? And so I think one data point we should add to this is, yeah, for those of you familiar with the India, India you know, Geo, kind of the mobile carrier, um, has grown you know, to 100 million faster than any of these tech companies, actually, in fact. So it continues to accelerate. And what's making it faster, you know, in what we've seen, so uh, CBI will be eight years old in February of this year, and the two kind of consistent factors that we've seen have been technology and data, right? And the marriage of those two is what is speeding things up. So, and what they have done is sort of done three things. I think data has made us more rational and empirical, and so we like to think of it as, you know, decibel-driven decisions are out and data-driven is in. Um, what technology has done is redrawn competitive lines, and we'll kind of get into that. And then technology and data coupled together have made product, process, distribution innovations happen at a rate that we've never seen before. So um, one of the things we're working on now is ingesting earnings transcripts, right? And so this is a look from 2008 just to 2015 of the mentions of the big five tech companies on all earnings calls. So this is 6,500 public companies over uh, over that time period, so every quarter, right? And so you can see, you know, there's lots of variation amongst the five, but in general, there's sort of an upward trend in terms of the amount of chatter about tech companies by public company executives, right? So retailers and, you know, CPG folks and all sorts of industries are talking about tech increasingly when they talk to the street. When we think of sort of, you know, this empiric, rational empirical world, you know, we think of it as sort of money ball for everything, right? And so money ball, for those who are not familiar, or saber metrics is sort of this, this use of probability and, um, you know, empirical information to make better predictions about players, right? And so traditionally it was these pundits, these scouts, and then, uh, you know, statistics came in. Um, how many of you use Spotify? 
you know, how many of you find Spotify's playlist recommendations freakishly good, right? Um, and that's, you know, that is data, right? That is machine learning and, and deep learning that they're using to make these recommendations. Um, there was an article in the New York Times many months ago, or probably now a year ago, that Target was able to use data to predict if somebody was l pregnant, right? Um, and so there was an interesting, scary anecdote in that where they were sending ads to a young woman and her dad came in and said, you know, hey, why do you keep sending ads to my daughter about pregnancy-related stuff? And, you know, he's like, she's absolutely not pregnant. And then, you know, she later broke it to him, like, hey, dad, I am kind of pregnant. Uh, so, um, so, you know, the, the sort of pregnancy prediction score, you know, again, another use of data. And then for those of you familiar with 538, um, you know, data to predict elections, right? So all of this has happened. I think people are starting to embrace data more um, in decision making, right? So now the loudest, the loudest person in the room, the most personable person in the room obviously helps, but that coupled with data is especially dangerous. Um, competitive lines being redrawn, right? So this idea of people staying in their lane has gone away, right? So I used to work at American Express for seven years. When I was there, it was, who did we talk about every quarter? It was Visa, MasterCard, Cap One, Citi. Um, you know, now new competitors emerge, and actually as business models start to get pressured, um, people who you think of as friends become frenemies, I guess. Um, and so we'll walk through that as well, right? So it's kind of interesting, you know, let's just take a couple of examples. You have Daimler versus Lexus and BMW, right? Then that expands into Alphabet, Tesla, Uber, um, you know, Walmart, Costco, Target, Alibaba, Amazon, right? And you can see this, you know, it's in ver a variety of industries. So I can keep going on this, but you know, you have your, your telcos and your cable companies, right? And then how do they compete with Netflix and YouTube, right? Um, my alma mater, Amex, right? Um, PayPal, Venmo, Alipay, Stripe, Adyen, et cetera, right? When we think of sudden or gradual than sudden, I think the Alipay WeChat example is amazing, right? So um, they've grown from 81.6 billion in 2012 to 3.9 trillion of volume. So in four years, a 48x increase, right? And so if you are a payment network, this should scare the shit out of you, right? And so really important how things happen quickly. Um, this is on that point of old friends becoming foes, right? So if you parse earnings transcripts, you'll see the term private label come up a whole lot um, in calls by retailers as well as CPG companies, right? And so this has become an increasingly popular trend where retailers are launching their own private labels. And, you know, it's hard to get, you know, when you hear the talking points, it's, you know, it's sort of this kumbaya thing, oh, we love our providers of products and the Part of product makers are saying, oh, we love our retail partners, but there is a definite tension that exists. And so again, competitive lines being redrawn. Amazon effect is very real, right? So I'm extending that earnings transcript graph out two more years. And so what you see now is, you know, it's no longer close, right? It was sort of Google, Apple, Amazon were kind of neck and neck, let's say. As of the la since 2016, you know, public company executives have Amazon on the brain. And you can see that here, right? So this is Walgreens, right? On this date, there was a rumor that Amazon might get into the pharmacy business, right? And so it was a weekend that fell in there. So just two trading days later, that was sort of the impact. And this happened across all the pharmacy companies, right? And so this effect of insurgents coming into a space is happening a lot more. It has direct impacts on businesses. Um, you know, great, I think Upfront Ventures put this data out a while ago. You know, what's it cost to launch a startup? Um, it was at a company back in the day called um, Cosmo.com, right? Anybody ever use Cosmo? Right, so Cosmo, uh, awesome time. Uh, we used to buy stuff for, for $2, sell it for $1, um, and uh, it, didn't, it didn't work out. Uh, 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 but, you know, Kind of, five, you know, a lot of money back then, AWS, Google, uh, Microsoft have made the cost of launching a startup come down a lot. And I think this quote by um, Alex at A16Z is, is perfect, right, around what the insurgents have to do, right, is can 
they get distribution before the incumbent gets innovation, right? And yesterday, Jim Adler, um, we had sort of an executive meeting in the morning with, with some senior execs, and he made a very similar comment. He said the automotive companies are battling, are trying to figure out high tech before high tech figures out automotive, right? And I think that's a tension that we see in virtually every industry right now. Um, other big thing kind of is this p faster product process distribution advantage, right? So you have uh, in direct-to-consumer, we just talked about that on stage, uh, you know, Gillette Dollar Shave Club is sort of one of the seminal examples there. You have Netflix kind of killing Blockbuster and targeting Hollywood, Airbnb attacking Hi Hyatt and Starwood. You know, when you look at valuations, again, Airbnb is now worth more than Hyatt, Starwood, Marriott combined. Um, so why do, if this is happening, if things are speeding up, why do corporations have trouble responding? Um, it is two things, right? It's sort of a skill problem and a will problem. And so, you know, on, this, on the will side is there is this weird instinctual reaction that big corporations have to shit on any idea that was not invented there. Um, and so they just don't have a will to sort of learn from these companies or these, these insurgent trends. And then there's a skill problem, and we'll walk through this. So the corporate playbook for how to deal with an insurgent is, comes down to these two strategies. It is either you talk shit about that company or you pretend it doesn't exist, right? Like, it's really not a strategy. And so we'll walk through some examples, right? So here is the uh, doesn't exist, right? Uh, excellent. That worked out well. Um, also, another one, uh, this is more the dismissal strategy. Um, so those of you who have Palm iPhones, please take a picture. Um, uh, you know, we see this a lot. I mean, I've seen many people, many retailers still say stuff like this, which boggles my mind, right, that people aren't going to do that on Amazon, right? Amazon is one of the biggest uh, retailers now of fashion, right, of clothing, Right? So there's like no category in retail that they're not going to go after. And yet, with straight faces, public company executives will get on calls with the street and say stupid shit like this pretty much on the regular. Right? Um, and then my favorite one, right? Uh, obviously, it has not aged well. Uh, um, so, you know, again, like this playbook is not, is not good, right? This one I thought was interesting, right? And so, again, I'm kind of picking on my my alma mater a little bit, right? But this is uh, kind of mixing two things here. This is Venmo, and, and, and Michael from Venmo is going to come up later. Venmo's kind of volume growth, payments volume growth over time, right? That is a ridiculous looking chart, right? That is 100% year over year kind of growth. And Amex mentioned Venmo for the first time in their annual report this last year, right? And so that the, the message that that sends to your own organization is is not a good one, right? It, is, it either indicates you're clueless or you're arrogant, right? And so I think acknowledging these competitors is something, and these trends is something that folks have to do earlier, right? Because I think you know, being paranoid is, is healthy. So let me give you some good news, right? This is kind of, we, we, have, we did this uh, survey of 670 plus kind of corporate executives asking them about their views on innovation. So the good news is corporations think a lot about innovation, right? And 85% of this 677 group said that innovation is very or extremely important. The problem is where they get their ideas from is just not enough, right? Their first two things were customers and employees, right? And that sounds really good in theory, but it leads to a lot of incrementalism. Um, and so they get their ideas that are incremental, and so their outcome they look for is generating more revenue from existing products and services. And so there's nothing wrong with that, but then you end up with, all you end up with is this, right? Um, and like, you should do this. I'm not, I don't mean to say you should not do stuff like this. Like, I, this, these are probably delicious. Um, <laughs> But, um, but like that cannot be your innovation strategy, right? Like this is very short horizon kind of stuff. And so on top of that, then the other challenge they have is this sort of build by partner. So when we ask these executives, you know, how, do you, how are you going to innovate, right? Most of them want to build, which would be good, except it takes them god awful long to do it, right? So it takes, you know, 60% of them take more than a year to get an idea out the gate, right? And again, these are incremental ideas. These aren't the, the game changer ideas, right? So you have this, 
will issue, right, where they want to crap on any idea that like may be coming to, to, to become something real. And then you have this problem of where they spend, where they've built skills up, which is a really incremental kind of business building initiatives, right? So what are the impacts of failing to respond, right? So suddenly comes quickly, right? Um, anybody have a guess as to whose stock chart this is? Anybody want to shout out a guess? Who said it? Blackberry. Wow, damn, you're good. All right, that is BlackBerry, yeah. Uh, so that's the launch of the iPhone. That's gradual. That's sudden, right? Um, that's what that looks like, right? And the best part of this is when we do this analysis, we see lots of companies in that sort of post-peak period being talked about really highly, right? So these are headlines from that gradual period. Like, if you're an exec at BlackBerry or an employee at BlackBerry, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. I love the one in the bottom right. Like, that's a weird anti-indicator, right? Like, if you two leaves you, joins you as a sponsor, like, that could be bad news. Um, so, um, uh, but you know, this was like, if you're a, a BlackBerry employee, you're feeling really good about yourself. Like you're reading good stuff, people say you're the shit, right? And then like, you're nothing. Um, anybody, any ideas on who this is? I've already mentioned this company before, right? So this is, this is uh, Blockbuster, right? So again, and it's interesting, we're doing some analysis around this, like this gradual decline, there's sort of this sweet spot of like this 20 to 24 month kind of range, and then there's, you know, this sort of big, big sudden drop, right? So we see this again and again. And then the other thing we've noticed is that shareholders are getting increasingly impatient, right? So this activist kind of thread that we're seeing more and more, right? So now it's not just about relevance and innovate or die or whatever sort of euphemism you know that you want and you want to go do your dog and pony shot in Silicon Valley. Like you actually have shareholders who like are demanding that you sort of uh, that you kind of get with it, right? And so these are examples of you know P and G and and ADP and Jana Partners was in Whole Foods. Um, I'll walk you through. There's kind of a lot on these slides, but you know this was interesting, right? With P and G getting blasted for not getting into online shaving, right? And like how Gillette was being hurt, right? And so this could be a really effective talking point by an activist investor, or this could be a real problem, but it is, it is being used now as a, a weapon, right, by, by shareholders as well. Um, you know, you have this with ADP, and you can see some of the talking points that Bill Ackman has kind of highlighted about uh, sort of leveling up their tech and their product. Um, you know, Ford lost its CEO, and they say part of the reason for that was an inability to keep up with sort of new trends around autonomy and other things. Um, Whole Foods, obviously, we know how that ended with the Amazon acquisition, which I think was a great outcome. But again, you had a lot of pressure from shareholders, which when you re if you haven't read this article, The Shelf Life of John Mackey, it is a fantastic article about his thinking about what drove the, the Amazon acquisition and just his disdain for activist shareholders, which is not surprising. Um, one of the more kind of forthright comments came from the CEO of J. Crew, who basically kind of acknowledged that he totally missed tech upending retail. And missing it looks like this, right? That same store sales at J. Crew over time, right? Like that is, that is ugly. Um, and so this is what the insurgent impact looks like, right? You've got activism and performance declines, and then you've got, you know, lots of people spending time with their family over on the right. Um, um, so, um, so, you know, this is like the impact of, of sort of failing to get with it, right? Um, so I think, you know, developing a skill to see around corners has now become, is, is important, right? And so knowing what you don't know, and again, like how can you use data and technology to, to know what you don't know, you know, about these trends, these insurgents, these technologies, um, you know, our view is that sort of the information is out there, right? They, there's this, these crazy statistics you see that 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years, and every day there's, you know, millions of petabytes of information created, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of information out there. Um, but the thing is we rely, we rely on sort of these old school ways of figuring out these trends, right? So even if we had the will to do it, we still rely on sort of, you know, this, right? We rely on customers and employees, which doesn't work. Um, 
you know, those methods I mentioned were sort of designed for a bygone era, right? So we have my favorite thing, like when we talk to clients sometimes is, or prospective clients are like, oh, how do you find out stuff? And they're like, we do desktop research, right? Like it's such a, such a glamorous way of saying Google, um, you know? Um, so, you know, there's lots of Googling that happens. People hire sort of management consultants and advisors to kind of do this stuff. And then people rely on their network. And so again, like, just like the incremental, you know, pumpkin flavored Oreos or whatever, like none of these are bad things to do, but you have to augment these things, right? Like I don't, have you ever met somebody who doesn't say they have a great network, right? Like you cannot, everybody cannot be above average. Um, and so, you know, these are kind of the old school methods, right? So if you take data and technology, what can you do with those, right? So one of the things we've tried to do was, and we're going to send this all out, so, um, but, you know, we looked at, okay, what's sort of market research 2.0 look like, right? If you really wanted to understand consumer habits, not just today, but in the future, like who are some of the companies and who are, what are some of the themes that are emerging? And you see that here. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on in sort of the expert augment, automation and augmentation space, right? So obviously in, in wealth management and other areas, but you know, everything from software development to reporting and editing, you see that there. Uh, you know, I think to find some of these trends, these things that are emerging, it's sort of you know, using machines for what they're good for, right? And so um, that's a big part of, of what we've been thinking about. So because I don't get the opportunity to get this many clients in a room together, I wanted to sort of give at least a quick five minutes on some of the things we're working on. Um, uh, so, you know, our view on this is kind of, uh, this information's in the exhaust, right, in the data exhaust, right? It's in transcripts and financial statements. It's in VC financings, et cetera. Um, but you need a good filter, right? It's not just, like, information. It's like you need a good filter for that. So, you know, part of it for us is how do we extend the graph, right? How do we know more about every entity out there? Um, so I wanted to give you kind of a view into some of the things we've been working on. One, uh, you know, I think a lot of folks think of us as sort of private markets, right? So we're actually expanding beyond that. We're launching public data, um, 50 exchanges, you know, tens of thousands of public companies coming soon. Um, this is one that came from clients, right? So uh, the amount, how many of you have ever built like a logo slide, right? So like is a constant, like, and you've got, and some people like, you know, have gone to great schools and you're on like Google Images looking for fucking logos all the time, right? <laughs> Um, right, so like really poor allocation of like human talent, right? Um, and so we've built kind of capabilities to not just get you the logos, but build you the market maps. And so you can actually spend time doing kind of what's, what you should do. Uh, this is like one thing that we built that is, would have changed my life back in the day at American Express. So I'd build a market map and people would, and my boss would come in and be like, hey, you forgot one logo, right? And like that's Jenga of market maps, right? Because it was like how do I get that logo on the market map without redoing the whole fucking market map, right? And like, that was really hard. So we built like, the, and our engineering team built this awesome thing. It's like sort of the easy button where you just press it and it like, you can add a new logo and it just redistributes them. So I'm, I'm personally, you know, would have saved my analysts a lot of time back in the day. So, you know, kind of one of the other things that we're working on. Um, Pivot tables, you know, they're great, but like how do we get you to just get you to the insights? So it's a big part of what we're doing is just generating kind of algorithmic reports for you. Um, earnings calls, I mentioned, we've been doing a lot with that, you know, and then being able to sort of do, find topics on those earnings calls is incredibly important to us. Um, and then finally, um, we've built, I think, the biggest database of market sizings out there. So we have 9,000 plus market sizings that we've sort of crowdsourced and gotten from extracting from unstructured documents. So that's what we're working on. Um, I'm going to just do a plug for our product team real quick. So if you have good things to say about the product, I'd love to talk to you. If you want to complain about the product, I would like you to find one of these three awesome people. Um, but feedback on the product, you know, getting this many clients in one place together is a privilege for us and, and being able to hear what you like, what you don't like is great. Um, you know, back to my sort of gradual uh, and then sudden, you know, and we have a lot of great speakers still coming up. I think when you, if you're not in the industry that Jet.com is in or Venmo is in or that Color Genomics is in, I think, you, you know, these are just examples. Like, still, you will learn a lot from these conversations, right? So what Liza sees on the private label side, that trend is going to influence retailers. Um, 
you know, PayPal and Venmo, what they've done, you know, just launching um, uh, Pay with Venmo and then uh, PayPal now doing wealth management, I think with Acorns within their app, a lot going on there. And then when you think about what Color Genomics is doing, you know, this idea of owning relationships on health, right? Anybody who has a relationship with consumers on health, whether it's CVS or whether it's a hospital system, um, is going to be impacted by this insurance, life insurers, et cetera. So, you know, I think there's a lot of things to be learned from the intersection of these different industries. So, um, again, thank you so much for coming out. Um, we have lunch now, so um, please indulge. And then we'll be back with um, Liza and Bradstone after lunch. Thank you.